again, for just a few moments, a proper perspective in a pandemic. And the reason I thought it was worth taking some time to preach in this direction and on this subject is that we've been in this pandemic long enough for it to impact anybody and everybody. Yeah. And with us going into what seems to be a season where uh, we could be going backward instead of forward, it can be discouraging. I've talked to people and I've listened and I, I see what's happening and I see the emotional and spiritual toll that it is taking on us because it is easy to lose perspective of all that is going on in the world and what God is really trying to do and how we are to be living as children of God. And so I want to spend some time helping us think through a little bit of this from, again, the subject of proper perspective in a pandemic. Now listen, just to kind of dive right in, you need to understand that Paul established this church here in Thessalonica uh, uh, during his second uh, missionary journey. It was in that time that Paul converted some Jews, but he converted a vastly large number uh, of Gentiles out of pagan worship into the way of Jesus Christ. And it was sometime after his departure that he wrote uh, this letter from many believe the city, the city of Corinth, to the church there in Thessalonica. It is, it is, it is in this letter that Paul Paul gives a particular emphasis to this to this relatively young young church that is coming out of paganism. He gives he gives emphasis here in in reminding them to remain. Diligent. He challenges them to remain steadfast in their push uh, and in their work for the Lord in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a good place to have a sermon right there to talk about the fact that, listen, we need to remember that Jesus Christ is, in fact, coming back. Somebody ought to say amen. Every now and again, we live a life like we don't understand and recognize that Jesus is, in fact, coming back. This world is not our our home and we have to learn to, to, to live like it. And so Paul challenges them. He gives instructions and he gives commands encouraging them to remain diligent and to remain steadfast in their push and in their work for the Lord in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back. He also spent some time addressing their their conduct as as believers and some apparent relative friction that existed uh, between members of the body of Christ there within that congregation. And so he, he addresses matters with regard to their lifestyle as well as how they relate to one another. But then when we pick up our reading here, when we pick up our text here this morning, Paul is bringing his letter to a close and he is offering some final admonition, some final encouragement, some final instruction, some final warning to, to the church there. And in verse 16, Paul commands them to rejoice always. And by that, he meant that they were to walk with a constant disposition. They were to walk with a constant attitude of joy uh, in the completed in the unconditional, permanent, and irreversible work of God in Jesus Christ on their behalf. He, he tells them before he puts his pen to rest that they ought to walk with a constant attitude uh, of joy in what Jesus Christ had done for them on the cross of Calvary. And then he moves on from verse 16 to 17 where Paul insists that they that they pray without ceasing that that they establish themselves uh, in, in prayer that that they, they that they uh, as be established in prayer not uh, as a as an aspect of, of of Christian living but as the sum total of Christian living he he tells them with that phrase pray without ceasing that listen you ought to live a lifestyle of prayer you ought to live a life in such a way in which your heart is constantly elevated to God and that your entire life is oriented around fellowship with the Holy Spirit and your whole life is oriented around being in the very presence of God. In other words, it's not something that you turn off on Friday night. 
It's not something that you turn on when you go to this person's house or that person's house. It's not something that you turn off and on when you get on Facebook or when you get on Twitter or when you get online. It is to live a life that is constantly, yeah, seeks to be in the presence of a heart that is lifted up to be in the presence of Almighty God. And so it is out of those two, those two commands, those, those two points of emphasis, uh, being constant in, in a prayerful mindset and having a constantly joyous disposition, it is out of those first two commands, it is out of those first two dimensions of Christian living that the verse under consideration flows in, in this verse. Paul says in verse number 18, in everything, give thanks. Now listen, as familiar as that phrase, give thanks, may be to you and I, it's worth pointing out that, that uh, for this, these, these recent pagan converts there in Thessalonica, this phrase, give thanks in everything, really first had a secular connotation before it had a spiritual connotation. Uh, for the pagans there in that day, thanksgiving was something that was offered to the gods in exchange for their favor and their benefits. It was giving thanks for something that you gave to the idol gods, to, the, to, to your deity of choice in exchange for the benefits and the blessings of that god in the future. And so it was something, thanksgiving was something that you used to bargain and partner with your God. And so it is within that context uh, that, that, that Paul offers uh, this admonition to in everything give thanks. Paul is saying that not so much that this is simply a command to thank God in everything, as much as he's saying this is a command to acknowledge where your blessings come from now that you are a person of God. Oh my God. I didn't even say to acknowledge where you know your blessings come from, to, to acknowledge that the source of your blessings are from above and not of this world. Now, listen, that's a good place for me to tell you that as a child of God, you ought to remember where your blessings and where your favor comes from. Now, sometimes you need to be reminded uh, that your blessings don't come from some source in the world, uh, that your blessings don't come from the universe, as people like to say now. Your blessings don't come from some kind of energy in the com cosmos. Uh, our favor and our blessings, the benefits and the goodness that you and I enjoy come from the almighty God above. Let me, let me rewind and say that again because somebody missed it. I, I said your blessings don't come from the universe and the cosmos. Come on, somebody. The universe didn't wake you up this morning and, and start you on your way. God did that. God did the, the cosmos didn't put food on your table. God did that. Energy in the cosmos didn't put clothes on your back. God did that. The universe, praise the Lord, has not helped you keep your sanity when you should have lost your mind. God in heaven did that. The cosmos didn't give you a peace that passes all understanding. The Holy Spirit deposited that into your spirit. Praise the Lord. The cosmos didn't make a way out of no way. God did that. The cosmos didn't bring you in proximity, close to God, in intimacy with God. That was God all by himself. And so Paul is reminding them, he's helping this pagan, poorly pagan congregation understand and remind them that, listen, the blessings that you enjoy, the spirit of thanksgiving that you have now is directed to the God above and not the gods of this world. And to that, Paul says, in everything, give thanks. And listen, the term, I'm hearing you, the term everything suggests doing it on every occasion and in every condition or circumstance of life. It suggests a personal obligation to have a thankful disposition at all times. Even when we're, we're, we're going through undesirable and, and crucial conditions like a pandemic, we got people, we got unemployment yeah. at levels we haven't seen in a long time. 
We got people stressed out in a way that they've never been stressed out in their lifetime. In the minds of many, things are darker now than they've ever been. There are more people who have who have a, a, a lack of clarity about the future now than ever before. Praise the Lord. We, we, there, there's more division now than there was than there was before. And if you're not careful, you'll lose your heart and your spirit of thanksgiving when you look at what's going on around you. But Paul is suggesting here, he says, in everything, whether, whether there is a pandemic or everybody's prospering, there ought to be an attitude of thanksgiving. It suggests uh, to the child of God that while we may not be able to give thanks for all things that happen, we can still give thanks in everything. But, but, but listen, this, this, is, this, is, this is as, as uh, well, let me put it this way. The truth is, and this is the reason Paul had to put this here, as simple of a command as this is, for many of us, compliance with the command is never that simple. Paul says, listen, in everything give thanks. Now for many of us, giving thanks in everything is a challenge I said, I mean, the command is simple, but compliance is complicated. So for many of us, giving thanks in everything is a challenge because we get in the Holy Spirit's way as he works to continuously create a spirit of thanksgiving. Listen, come on, I'm about to get, I'm about to get real practical here. Uh, some of us cannot give thanks in everything because we're too busy comparing ourselves <laughs> to everybody else. Come on, come on. I'm talking to somebody out there. You, 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 your day is going great until you get on your timeline. Come on. Now, I need, I need the real church to wake up. Come on, y'all. Y'all talk. Y'all talk back to me. Put something in there. Come, come on. Your day is going just fine until you get on your timeline. And you see somebody over there in the Bahamas. And come on, somebody. You, you, see, you see a couple all smiling, celebrating their 10th anniversary. And they, they writing a, a mile-long paragraph about how much they love each other, even though they can't see. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, you, 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 every, everything is great. If we're not careful, we can lose our voice of thanksgiving and that spirit of thanksgiving comparing ourselves to everybody else. The reason that's significant is because in this season in particular, and I'm starting to lose my voice, uh, in this season in particular, we're sitting at home and spending all day on Facebook and Instagram. Come on, somebody. Come on, now more than ever, your, your data is out of control because you're spending all day scrolling on your timeline looking at everybody else's business and what everybody else is doing, and you're comparing yourself to what everybody else has and what everybody else doesn't have uh, compared to what you have, and it's, it, it, it is robbing you of your spirit and your voice of Thanksgiving. Come on, somebody. Let, let, let me let you in on a secret. Everybody is online presenting the best of themselves. In case you hadn't, hadn't figured it out, and of course I'm being facetious, people, people don't go online on their on they worst day. Come on, you, you, you go online after your hair got dead. Come on, somebody. You, you, you go online to celebrate the promotion. You go online to celebrate the anniversary. You go online, praise the Lord. You, 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 you log in. You, you type a post to create a post when you're at your best. And if you're not careful looking at everybody at their best, you'll develop a false impression about how life really is. Trying to compare yourself. Come on, somebody. You know, we all got those screens. So it's funny. Some of us, we know people like that. They, but they, if you look at what they post, life is on and popping all the time. Come on, somebody. Huh? You see them strolling and they standing in front of the Mercedes. But you know they drive a Honda. Come on, somebody. Y'all talk back to me. 
huh? They take the pictures in front of, in front of, uh, in, 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 in the kitchen of a big, beautiful house, and it's a model home. Y'all ain't talking back to me, come on. Cause we know people that stunt in front and all, and all that, and if you're not careful, you'll lose your spirit of things, even comparing yourself to something that's not even real. Mm -hmm. And so some of us, some of us can't have the, can, some of us have difficulty complying with the command because we're too busy comparing ourselves to other folk. But then there are others of us who, who can't comply with the command because we're too consumed complaining about our circumstances. Somebody said it like this, the soul that gives thanks can find comfort in everything. But the soul that complains can find comfort in nothing. And, if, and the problem with complaining, listen, let me give it to you from a theological perspective, is that when you complain about your circumstances, you're demonstrating a lack of trust in God's ability as God. What you're really saying is you don't trust God to be God, but you complain about what's going on in your life. But listen, I want you to understand this. Being thankful in all circumstances sees the bigger picture. Being thankful in all circumstances reflects the fact that you understand that God is always in controlling power. God is always in the driver's seat. God is always in control. And that you trust Him even when it does not feel like things are going the way you plan. It is, it, is, it is to say that I still trust God even when it feels like stuff is going bad. Even though my employer is falling on earth, I still trust that God is in control. Even though capacity in these hospitals is still going down or going up or whatever, I still trust God. Even though I'm not sure what this economy is going to do, I still trust God. Same old ragged car, but at least you wrote. 
Are you going to be tired of the same old job, but at least you got some income coming? Come on, somebody. At least you got some income uh, coming in. You may be tired of the same old house or the same old apartment, but at least you got an address to get your mail. Come on, son. At least you got somewhere, somewhere to go. You may be tired of your man. You may be tired of your woman, but at least you ain't at the red table. You can lose your house, 
You can lose your car. You can lose your position. You can lose friends, but there ought to still be a reason to be faithful because you got. Because you got God. I said there's always something to be thankful for. Even if it's just the fact that you know God is in there with you. And if God sees it, it's just a matter of time before things turn around. And Paul says, it says to that, he says, he says, that's God's, that's God's will for you. That's the, the, the B part of verse 15. He says, that's, that's God's will for you. A saving, come here. A saving, trusting, intimately connected, entangled, secure relationship in God through Christ. Paul says that is God's will for you. Paul says, he says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for you that you enjoy the blessings and the benefits that come with doing the will of God by your following of Jesus Christ. It's his will for you to enjoy an, an inner joy that is rooted in God. An open line of communication that is connected to God. That's to pray without ceasing and rejoice together more. And he says it's, it's God's will, his desire, his destiny for your life. If you're a child of God, regardless of who you are, where you are. To have a heart a faithfulness that trusts God. And listen, I need you to understand that for the people of God, nothing can be more fulfilling because joy, prayer, and thanksgiving is what makes the Christian walk worthwhile. Those are the things that open the door of continued blessing. And those are the things that make the Christian walk right now worthwhile. Listen, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't about cars and houses and bank accounts. It's about having some joy, some communication with God, and a heart that thanks God consistently for what he's done for you. That's, that's what, that's what God desires for you. Listen, we, you know, we, everybody talking about red table talk. Yes, sir. If there was ever, if there was ever proof uh -oh. that you could have all of the stuff, and still be miserable in your own skin. You can live in a house so big that two people can live in it and never see each other. You can have more cars than you can drive. More money than you can count. You can get more attention than you can process and filter. More fame than you can handle and still not have joy <laughs> and have peace with God. And so Peter says God's will for you is not stuff. Because stuff won't get it. Stuff won't hold you. Stuff can't keep you. He says it's the will of God that you rejoice. That you talk to God. That you communicate with him. That you connect with him. And out of that is birth a 
a heart that trustfully thanks God. Listen, as I close one, I want to share this story with you. I'm about to wrap it up. I'll give you the key. Basically, we're still trying to figure it out behind the scenes. We're having a good time with this. Talking about the fact that we have to find what's thank worthy in every situation. You know, last week, the week maybe before, uh, we took our kids, Latari and I, we took our kids to Jurassic Quest. They love dinosaurs. Jurassic Park. We got all the Jurassic Park movies on the on the on the uh, on the on the uh, what do you call it? The storage. TV uh, got the got the movies on, on on the streaming services and and you know Julian and, and Jensen and Julian they got all little dinosaurs they play with and stuff like that and so last week we we, we went to Jurassic Quest and we had a, had a blast but it and we saw this one dinosaur in particular it's called Spinosaurus it's like one of the it's the one that killed T Rex it's like king of and so, but it reminded me of a scene in the movie, and I forget where, I think it might have been Jurassic Park 3, where they trick the guy that's going on to this island, the plane crashes, and then he's stranded there. And they look for this little boy that's on the island. And it's toward the end of the movie, and they're on this boat going down the river, and they hear the satellite phone ringing. Now, the satellite phone is what, they, is what allows you to basically connect from anywhere. Where, where you don't have a cellular service, you got a satellite phone, you, you, you're good. And so they, they have a satellite phone on the plane, they lost it, some guy was with them who had it, got eaten, and so they hear the phone. And so they're going down the river, and they hear the satellite phone ringing. They hop out of the boat, they run off to the, to the water, into the shore, and they, find, and they see where the ringing is coming from. And the ringing is coming from a huge pile yeah. of dinosaur yeah. mess. I like that. Dinosaur droppings, if you can call it a dropping. It's like a truckload, all right. But the phone is in the dinosaur. What am I saying? They dug through yeah. all of that <laughs> to get the phone. And while the phone was ringing, the dude didn't even wipe the phone off before he put it to come on, right, before he put it to the And the point here is. Although it was in some mess, he saw through the mess and dug through the mess to get to the blessing of that fall. What am I saying? I'm saying for some of us, you look at your life, and your life sometimes it looks like. And sometimes your life smells like. A big pile of. <laughs> but I'm helping you. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to encourage you to understand that even in all of that, there's salvation and there's redemption and there's a blessing. But sometimes what you got to do is dig through and dig past. Some nasty, very unreliable, cir undesirable circumstances. Sometimes you have to look past some other people's stuff. I'm trying to keep it. To get to what God is trying to show you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so, and so even, even when we find ourselves in those kinds of conditions and circumstances, we have to find a way to maintain our spirit of thanksgiving, our spirit of joy, 
in our spirit of trust in God. Listen, I am done. But I want you to understand as we prepare to pray and as we prepare to call, that we don't have to, to worry about going through adversity alone. Because God has promised to give us the strength to endure. Paul spent some time, some other time in this letter, helping them understand the, the relationship, the empowering dynamics of God. He helped them understand that they were not in life alone, but they were doing life with God. So I encourage you as we try to talk about maintaining this proper perspective in a pandemic, don't forget to do life with God. You are, not, you are not equipped to do life by yourself. There are circumstances and conditions that require the help and the power and the influence of Almighty God. So we encourage you through the adversity, through the ups and downs, through the pain, through the doubt and the darkness to continue to do life with God and trust God. Somebody said it like this, life it's 10% about what happens to you and 90% about how you respond to what happens to you. I know, I know you may be in circumstances that, that feels like the world is closing in on you. That's the 10%. I want you to understand though that the success and the victory comes in the 90%. How you respond to what is happening to you. And as we just said this, when you trust God and you put your faith and you're hoping Him, not only do you enjoy the victory, but you enjoy a peace of mind along the way. Because your confidence is in the one who's in control. We said earlier, a few weeks ago, the fact that you're worried about something is proof that you're not in control. That's why you need to put your, your problems and your concerns into the hands of someone who's in control. Jesus said it like this, John 16, 33, he says, in this world you have trouble, but take heart. He says, I've overcome, I've overcome the world. In other words, everything you, you can go through and will go through, I've already gone through. But I didn't just go through it. I conquered it. I have, I have the victory. And in Jesus, you and I, we have the victory. And that victory is what allows us to have a proper perspective in a pandemic. Listen, we already know how this thing is going to work out. White House don't know. CDC doesn't know. County judge doesn't know. City council doesn't know, but God knows. If there's one thing we know, we know it's going to work out the way God intends for it to work out. And the God I serve ain't never made a mistake. And he's never made a decision that wasn't for my good. So that gives me the strength, the, the peace of mind to just trust him. We have a proper perspective in this pandemic. Hey, listen, if you need prayer, we invite you to leave a comment. We'll pray with you. If you need to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, if you've not put him on in the watery grave of baptism, having confessed your faith and repented of your sins, we'll do it today. You let us know, you leave a comment, we'll reach out to you today, and we'll see that we that you're accommodated. There may be somebody who just needs prayer. We'll pray with you, and we'll pray for you. But somebody who's lost their perspective in this pandemic, we're going to pray right now that God gives you the proper perspective. Let you keep your hand in the Lord's hand. Lord willing, we'll see you at the same time next week. In the meantime, share this live tag. Somebody, let somebody know what the Lord is doing in your life. Leave a comment. Tell, tell, tell the people in the Lord how much you appreciate him doing just now. As we now pray as we close. Father,